Okay, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Um, my name is Nicola Banks. I'm a senior lecturer and the deputy director of the Global Development Institute. And it's with absolute pleasure that I introduce our two guests um, today. We have Dr. Yelma Kamstra and Zoe Abrahamson. Uh, so Yelma is a senior researcher at the, in the evaluation department of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He's also the um, author of The Theory of Change Behind the Dialogue and Dissent Policy Framework for Funding Civil Society Organizations that we're going to learn about tonight. Um, so here at GDI, we're particularly enthusiastic and interested in this new and quite radical policy framework um, because it opens up very new channels of operation for NGOs to help them become more um, political vehicles of social transformation. Um, the challenges that NGOs face in living up to their transformative potential has been a major subject of interest that we've been engaged in here in Manchester over the last 30 years. So we're also really pleased to see it as, a, as an example of research with impact. The donors are listening. <laughs> um, so Dutch NGOs have praised the new framework as an island in a sea of managerial thinking. It's really different to what other donors are doing when it comes to funding. Um, the Development Assistance Committee have highlighted its innovations as something other donors should be learning from. So we're also lucky to have Zoe Abrahamson here from BOND. BOND is the leading representative body of UK development NGOs, and she's their senior funding advisor. And she's going to talk to us, um, reflecting on Yelma's presentation, about what the chances are for the UK government to follow a similar, um, more transformative pathway to NGO funding. Well, hope the, picture is, <laughs> the, the future picture is rosy, but perhaps that's not going to be um, the case. So together, uh, both Yelma and uh, Zoe will hopefully trigger some juicy questions for the questions and answers that follow. Um, it's worth mentioning the lecture is being recorded, and it will be online afterwards, but the question and answer session is not made publicly available, so please don't worry about asking anything political or juicy. It will be a confidential thing. Um, please also feel free to tweet uh, using the hashtag, G hashtag GDI lecture, and we'll love to see that. But on to the main event. Yelma, welcome. Thank you again for joining us. Thank so you. I'll hand over to you. I should have done this before, I think. Let me see. Should be easy, right? Okay, so thank you for having me here. I thought to start off with a very short introduction about who I am and where I come from. So basically I started my career in academia and did a lot of research on civil society organizations as a, as a researcher and as a teacher with development uh, studies. And based on my research, I basically came to a conclusion that um, well, <laughs> there's a lot of problems with development aid in general. The, the system of development aid is structured in such a way that you create, create a lot of problems. So when I was browsing on the internet, I found a job opening in the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I made the switch from academia to policy world, which is quite a big shift. So. I was able to use the lessons I gained from my research to try to implement them in, uh, in practice. The um, thing I will be presenting today is basically I will start with a little bit of a kind of an academic background to the subject and then I will jump into the practice of the subject. So both my, my parts will be represented in this, uh, in this talk. Um, I've been speaking with a lot of people about this, um, about this policy uh, framework, also a lot of British people that came over to the Netherlands. Basically, but one thing that kept returning was, of course, the Brexit process. Uh, many people were making jokes of it, I mean, the British persons coming over, so I thought I was allowed to have at least, at least one Brexit joke. Because I feel a little bit scared that maybe something like that might happen in the Netherlands as well. And, you know, I just became a father. This is my son. And I think he might grow up to be 
the person that will be uh, the next kind of uh, <laughs> Brexit promoter in the Netherlands. Okay, over to the lecture. Basically, when you look at development issues, uh, if you look in, in the development literature, you can find two big schools of thoughts between, uh, with thoughts on development. On the one hand, you have a more technical approach to development issues, and on the other hand, you have a more political approach to development issues. So I will be explaining a little bit about the ideas and reasoning behind these schools of thought, and then I will place or position the civil society promotion policy of the Netherlands within those school, uh, schools of thought. So, if you look at, like, why do we have a development problem? What is the problem behind why are people uh, in poverty? Why are nations in poverty? Basically, if you have a more technical, managerial approach, your analysis is kind of like, okay, development, it's a linear and a technical process, which we can plan and control. And we need to really realize tangible goals with that, tangible results. So if you have the right tools and the right kind of approaches to support development, then you can apply them all over the world. Of course, when I'm presenting these two schools of thought, I'm going into the extremes a little. Just reality is always somewhere in the middle. So it's very much an approach like this. So you have linear developments. If we put in A, we will get B. Uh, we need to find the right solutions and we can measure stuff. So this is really uh, the kind of uh, way we approach development. On the other hand, there's a more social transformative approach to development, which says basically that, you know, development, it's much more about a diffuse political process. It's about we need to change unequal power relations in this world, and that requires local ownership rather than some variables we need to control. And development is really context-specific. So we need to be uh, looking at what people in their own country need and how, how, how it is structured over there. To give some examples of... Um, so let me first... So it's more about this. There is no single reality. Uh, it's much more about complexity. The, the boundaries are vague. It's about unequal relations between people. If we put in A, the context is so messy, we don't know what will get out. You have multiple perspectives. Is it a B or a 13? You know, when perspectives change, you can see different things. It means different things for different people. So development becomes much more messy. Um, I think, uh, for instance, if you look at this more linear approach to development and a more technical approach, uh, you could think of... Um, more concrete projects, like technical uh, projects, uh, sowing seeds uh, in agriculture and stuff. But it's also in institutional levels. You, know, you can also have more linear type of thinking. For instance, I think one of, the big, um, one of the big examples were the structural adjustment plans by the World Bank, which is basically introducing a kind of uh, a one-way solution to, um, to help developing countries uh, become more stronger. So this was particularly about uh, an economic approach. So you need to outsource all your social services and stuff to the market because then you will become more uh, efficient because governments are corrupt and we need to uh, provide people with the right services. So it's not only about small technical approaches, but it's about a way of thinking. So linear versus more complex. The dialogue in the SEND framework, which is the name of the civil society support framework, basically starts from this social transformative idea that it's about power relations and unequal power relations between people. I will go into details later on. So if you translate that from your notion about development, about what is the role then of civil society within this kind of school of thought, so in the managerial school of thought, civil society organizations, they are basically kind of complementary to states and donors. They have an instrumental value for money. And they are effective and efficient service providers. 
that can provide services maybe better than governments which are corrupt or malfunctioning. And in that paradigm, citizens become customers because um, they basically, they need services and you need to uh, account for the money you put in there for your customers. I think this paradigm has been very, very strong, also in the UK, also in the Netherlands. We see it not only in development policies, but in, in many policies. Uh, citizens have been approached as customers for, for, yeah, I think since the 80s, uh, mainly. But there's also a different way of approaching it. Sorry. So in this technical role, civil society organizations are doing these, these, these kind of projects. So it's tangible, it's uh, helping farmers with new seeds, it's um, uh, the cooking stove things, it's the wash projects. So it's stuff you can really touch and feel, and um, which basically it also, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very easy for people to relate to. It's also very easy for people, more easy maybe to, to give money to, because you can see it, you can feel it. In the social transformation paradigm, autonomy is crucial for effectiveness of development projects. And it's not so much about value for money in the first place, it's much more about an intrinsic value of CSOs. Basically, as part of a democratic system, you need critical citizens to be, well, to be a counterbalance to government, uh, also to inform government about citizen uh, issues. So they are part of a democratic network and you need them. And then there's a political role in this paradigm for civil society organizations. As citizens are then not customers anymore, but they are rights holders. And they can use civil society organizations to claim their rights. So instead of this value for money, you can also turn it around. It's, it's money for values. You need to stand for certain values. So in a political role, you start doing a lot of different kind of things as a civil society organization. Actually, I like the, the picture on the top left. El agua es un derecho humano, which means water is a human right. So you can frame this issue of water. You can frame it as a te technical issue. So you have a village where there is no clean drinking water. And your, uh, so basically the, the analysis of your problem is we need to bring water to this village. And then you can have a bid for NGOs or companies to uh, fetch this water for the lowest price in this village. But then if you move it more into a political analysis of the same problem, then you might zoom out from this village because in this country um, you have a village where they have uh, no water, but they live next to a city where the water is, is really okay. So the problem is maybe not so much a technical problem because they know how to, uh, how to provide drinking water in this country. It's just that it's more a, a, a matter of an unequal distribution. So then the matter becomes political. And that's what the sign here shows. It's, it's a human right. It's something uh, we are entitled to. Um, there's been, for instance, a lot of protests uh, I've seen in Ghana uh, against privatization of drinking water, exactly because they didn't want it to be on the market because they saw it as a private good. So they were protesting against this, civil society organizations. So when you start approaching development more as a distribution problem, more as a political problem, you start to do different things. You start to organize people, you start to engage media often, but also, maybe this is a golf game of uh, Barack Obama, if you uh, know the right people in the right places, you might need to play uh, a game of golf or drink a cup of coffee uh, to get results. So there's a different way of getting development results in, in that sense. It's maybe sometimes a little bit more difficult to explain also to people. So again, the dialogue and dissent totally relates to the social transformative kind of rules of the game. 
And then what should you do as a donor in both paradigms? Basically, in the managerial paradigm, the donor is behind the, uh, the steering wheel. So donors take the lead, they ensure the value for money. Because it's taxpayers' money, they need to ensure that it's being spent right. And they need to be able to account for that money. So the way they've been doing that is mostly by choosing um, professional civil society organizations to implement their programs because then they know that they will get a quality of work, a high quality of work. And they make contractual relations with these kind of organizations with performance indicators and logical framework type of agreements like, okay, I will give you this much money and you will deliver me so, so and so many products. Or you will help at least so many farmers. Um, and then we will control and check throughout the years whether you are uh, reaching those indicators. So as a donor, you're very much, uh, uh, well, grasping onto what you're doing. You're on top of it. Which is, of course, because it's taxpayers' money and we should really be uh, careful with what we do with that. So um, it's also about visibility. It's about, okay, we are there and we're doing it. On the other hand, it's a different type of role as a donor in this more political, uh, social transformative uh, approach. Basically, local CSOs should take the lead in development processes. They, donors should provide financial support, institutional and moral, but they shouldn't be above the recipient uh, party. And basically, selecting civil society organizations to become a partner, it's, it's not so much about this kind of professionalism. So professionalism becomes less of a selection criteria, but it's more about legitimacy. Because if you want to have political change on subjects in countries, you need to relate to local uh, actors which are basically legitimate in their, own, uh, in their own context, in their own country. Otherwise, you will be only pushing uh, a, basically a Western agenda and your work becomes very fragile because it's very easy for, for people to say, well, you came here with Dutch money, you're just pushing a Dutch agenda. Uh, then it's very easy for local power holders to say, we will not change anything. So you really need to relate to local concerns, local needs, and local actors. And instead of performance indicators, it's much more about kind of process tracing, qualitative type of data. Um, and it's more about trust, because we cannot fix beforehand what kind of results we will get if we start to try to improve certain policies, if we want to have certain laws adopted, you never know whether you will succeed. It's very difficult to, um, to fix that beforehand. So we need to trust much more in the process in, and in going there together. Because everybody has a piece of the puzzle and we can only fix it together, basically. So it's a very different type of approach. But over here you can see that the dialogue in the SAND framework for CSOs is starting to be pulled towards the more managerial side because this is where a Ministry of Foreign Affairs comes in, this is where northern CSOs come in who have structures and rules in place which are basically, they have been structured for this more managerial type of demands over, well, the past uh, decades basically. So you don't change that overnight. So this is also where it starts getting uh, interesting, basically, because you have this, on the one hand, this more linear focus, more technical, focused on numbers, and to measure is to know, and on the other hand, you say, no, it's more about politics, it's about struggle, it's about emancipation, and we should trust the process. So, you really see that this is what's happening, basically, with the dialogue and the sand policy, <coughs> that you enter an area of tension where the, the different rules of the game are starting to, well, to, to basically um, to, to make, a, I think, a very interesting uh, policy scene within the ministry, within the Netherlands, but also in the country where it's being implemented. So let me go into some of the specifics after this slide. Just to say that I, I stole this uh, slide from Duncan Green, 
I think it very much shows um, when you can maybe better use a political approach or a more uh, flexible approach and when you can use a more technical and fixed approach. So if you're very sure about your in intervention, if you've done it many times, if there's been a lot of research on your strategy and you know the context, you know how it works, then uh, you should maybe do this type of solution because that is really the best value for money. That's when you will get, uh, will help the most people. In many contexts, basically, uh, we don't know. It is often much more complex than we, than we beforehand thought. Um, we don't know our strategies that well. And even simple technical solutions might have profound political or social repercussions, which we could not think of beforehand. So it really is about thinking, okay, which approach should I take in which, in which situation? It's not that the one is better than the other or the other than, than the other one. So it's really about uh, when should I do what? So it's about the analysis. Okay, so going back to civil society aid, there's been a lot of criticism in literature. Uh, there's been a lot of studies done on, um, on basically uh, the way that donors have been promoting civil society, which really started out as a very political agenda uh, especially after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, civil society promotion became a very strong, well, a strong way of trying to promote democracy, especially in post-communist Europe. And it's been spreading also uh, from there around the world. But the thing is that the way it's organized uh, prevents basically civil society organizations to take up this political role because there's lack of ownership and autonomy. Um, there's lack of contextualization, like trying to promote it in the same way in many different countries. Uh, organizations change their mission when funding changes. I saw it in, in several countries. In, in Ghana, one respondent told me, ah, you know, our mission is so broad. If the donor changes, we can, we can fit in nicely. So they anticipate the, 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 the donor changes after, after Every five to six years, you know, you have a change. There's a new concept. There's a new uh, development trend going on. So the donors will be going there, and then the donors will be going there, and then there's a new political wind, and they will be going there. So this is one of the main criticisms on um, it, 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 it. It causes these kind of processes to start. So lack of legitimacy, donor dependence, civil society organizations who are more looking towards their donor and uh, dancing to their tune rather than looking towards their constituencies and representing them uh, uh, the way they should, maybe. So basically, and that's also one of the things I found in my uh, PhD research, is that due to the rules that donors uh, accompany to funding, they basically, um, they basically, uh, how, how can I say this? you're not able to, to achieve your own goal anymore. If your goal is democratization through strengthening civil society organizations, then the way you, you support them, you basically undermine that goal because they're not legit, legitimate anymore. They don't represent any of the people in those countries. So there's no way that you will achieve the goal, uh, especially if you're talking about strengthening the voices of marginalized communities, which is in, is in many of these policies. The marginalized communities are not represented by these professional NGOs. There's academics like, 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 like me, basically. So, how does the dialogue and dissent policy try to navigate this tension between these cool sort of thought, and how does it try to um, react to this critique, basically? Because I think that the, this policy framework is, at least the one I, I know of in the, in the Netherlands, is the first policy framework that really tries to react to, the, to, to those critiques. How can we make it political again? How can we make it relevant for local uh, people again? Um, so how do we do that? I think, first of all, it's the shift from uh, a more service delivery approach to a really a political approach. Service delivery, under the dialogue and dissent framework, you could not get any funding for that. There's, around the world, there's so many funding for, for service delivery, we cannot have it in this funding framework. 
Second of all, a partnership approach. It's not like a funder-recipient relation anymore, but we need to get on a more equal level with each other. And third, we need flexible monitoring and evaluation. I'll go into some <coughs> examples. So basically, if you take a political approach, the way we operationalize that in the ministry is, okay, we, we need to start with civil society organizations and strengthen their capacity on lobby and advocacy. And also the legitimacy. If they have a stronger capacity, then they will be able to implement better and more lobby and uh, advocacy initiatives. And then if you're better at doing these kind of initiatives, you might start having a change. It can be in agenda setting, in framing a public debate, in creating space to engage. Um, and then maybe there might be a change in norms, in behavior, in policies of political actors. So to, um, to give an example, in, in the Netherlands, I'm, I'm not sure whether you also had this discussion here, there was a big discussion on the, the level, level, the number of insects dropping. So you can frame this uh, as a CSO concerned about, about nature, you can frame it as a, as a, as a natural disaster. But with more right-wing government parties, and, um, and uh, it's, it's, that won't be the right way to go about this strategy. So what they did in the end was framing it as an economic issue, uh, appealing to farmers. Like, okay, you need, to, you need insects to be able to fertilize your crops and everything. So that's how they were able to, um, to, to, to change the debate that was going on. And also they were elected to the table. So experts were invited by parliament you know, to come and discuss. Um, and then you can see uh, people picking up on this kind of issue and trying to make a real change in policies and laws. And these kind of processes are, um, are the kind of processes that this policy framework is, is trying to support, but then, of course, in developing countries. Um, sorry, so, and it, the arrow goes up and down because you never know how such a process will go. These processes are really messy. Um, the one day it, you, you might think that you almost reach your goal and then the next day uh, you're back to square one again. So then it's really difficult to beforehand fix some uh, outcomes or some uh, targets of um, indicators that you would like to achieve in, with your funding. So it's much more about describing the process, what you did and, and why you made certain decisions and uh, account for the money in that way. So to give uh, an example I uh, saw in Indonesia, one of the organizations uh, basically made a very nice use of, of technology. They trained an Indonesian organization to use drones and to map uh, palm oil plantations with that. And basically um, the, it, it brought them the information, uh, a very clear picture of places where palm oil factories were, uh, plantations were um, breaking the law. Uh, and that was in many places, like being too close to the river or encroaching on natural areas. And when they had this data, they were able to go to the government with this data to show them that, hey, uh, your laws are being broken. And Basically, the, the local government in Kalimantan, they were very happy with this data because for the first time, they were able to, uh, to, to at least try to hold these companies accountable because their capacity was very low uh, in terms of, of manpower, but also in terms of these kind of technological uh, means. They didn't have that. And when I was speaking with them, they explained to me like, okay, we have these companies here and they, for us, they cause a lot of social problems. Uh, the working conditions are not very well. Uh, also, they destroy the roads with their uh, very heavy loaded trucks. Uh, and outside the government building, we have uh, people protesting against that, even though we cannot really um, uh, do anything about it. So they were actually very happy with this type of lobbying advocacy from, um, from this civil society organization, and they even um, they even invited them to, to uh, be trained by them 
So in the end, the civil society organization was training government in the use of drums so they could enforce their own laws. At the same time, within this policy framework, there were actors that were uh, working at the European level. So there's been a, ba a ban on palm oil uh, recently from, I think, from Indonesia and I think also Malaysia on the palm oil that's been produced uh, in the wrong con uh, with the wrong conditions. So this was... Uh, partly also brought about by a lobbying advocacy campaign of organizations um, which were part of this uh, program. And what they did was they, they brought a lot of their local partners from Liberia, from Indonesia, and from one other country. They brought them to, uh, to The Hague and to Brussels just to tell their personal stories about what, what these plantations did in their personal lives. Um, so you see you have the, the, the connection also with the international, uh, from making the connection from the local level to the international level. And there you see also a, a shifting roles between um, civil society organizations in the Netherlands that used to be very much focused on poverty reduction through service delivery. They now have a very different role. They, they connect their partners to political fora, nationally and internationally, so it's a very different type of, uh, of action, what they're doing. I just took a cut out of the civil society theory of change figure. So basically, the partnership model, it very much relates to these kind of social transformative princi principles of, of being more equal partners. And I think the... the the thing on the right is basically it could be the Dutch ministry, but it can also be uh, a northern NGO. So because they're also donors in themselves. So as a donor, you pro provide the funding, the technical expertise. Uh, as a ministry, you can divide, uh, provide diplomacy. And you can broker relations so to these international fora for your local partners. And local partners, they can activate the, their constituencies. They can mobilize them and they can bring them or help them to start to have political participation. So if you're a marginalized group and in the city they have drinking water and your com community does not get drinking water, you need to do something about it. You need to become part of the conversation. You need to know where the national budget goes. You need to raise your voice. That's basically uh, what you're trying to do. But I think also the left hand is also, does also apply to northern NGOs. We also need to activate people here and mobilize them here to start, or basically to stop buying the wrong clothes that have been produced in sweatshops. We need to mobilize people here to start using clean energy more because we have climate change, which is affecting a lot of people in developing countries. So I think you move in both perspectives here. I think what's very interesting is the, the diplomacy side of, of things. Usually donors and ministries are kind of uh, risk averse, especially when it comes to politics. So I think also here within the ministry, this diplomacy part, it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> Some of the issues uh, are, are really pr precarious, basically. One of the partnerships is about, well, uh, the natural environment. And there was an NGO in, uh, in uh, Nigeria entering the Dutch embassy uh, to, to discuss climate issues and to discuss pollution. And then when he was exiting the embassy, then somebody from Shell came in. So, of course, a government has multiple, um, in a sense, multiple identities. You have multiple um, things that you are striving for. There's aid, there's trade. These are both combined within the ministry, in, in our ministry. So there's always uh, the, the coherence issue. And I think that what this policy framework does is it puts it on the table and it makes it discussable so we can have a conversation about it. Um, but also diplomacy, it really, I think it works, it works very well in some cases. For instance, there was um, a Dutch prime minister, the Dutch prime minister was visiting Vietnam with a trade delegation. And because of this program, CSOs were able to uh, contact the embassy because we work through our embassies as well. So we are a partner as a government, which means that 
our embassies at country level are also a partner. So the civil society organizations uh, with their networks worldwide cooperate with the embassies. So the Fairware Foundation um, was able to tag along with a high-level visit of um, a trade delegation of the Netherlands to Vietnam. So over there, they were able to have a, uh, a fashion show with, um, uh, with uh, stressing the need for fair, fair clothing, uh, but also uh, yeah, about gender and, and diversity issues. So I think that's a good, that's a good way of how you can use um, maybe embassies also to promote certain ideals and certain values through these civil society organizations. Basically, you team up with them. I think some other examples are that um, around the world, the civic space is deteriorating. So in many countries, it becomes more dangerous to be, to be an activist. People are, are literally being killed. So embassies can also provide safe spaces for people. Um, they can refer people to something like shelter city programs where activists that are being threatened can spend the time somewhere else, to cool, like, uh, like a cooling down period. Um, so it's really uh, this kind of serious stuff as well. And of course, diplomats being diplomats, uh, doing the marshes, so behind the scenes, uh, speaking with other high officials about certain issues that CSOs have raised with them. So it basically says that as a donor, you're not only uh, it's not only about spending money, it's not only about giving funding, but you also, especially as a Ministry of Foreign Affairs with this huge diplomatic network, you also have something, to, uh, something else to bring to this development agenda. Namely, you have your, your diplomatic power. You're also a political, a political uh, actor within the field. So you can team up with civil society organizations to try to implement that agenda. So, flexible monitoring evaluation, it sounds as the, as the most boring part, but I think it's one of the most um, important ones, because basically what came out of my, uh, my research is that this is where the trouble starts, basically. Because there are so many, many and strict rules attached to funding, it means that you need to be quite a professional organization to be able to access this kind of funding. Um, just to have a very, sh a very short recap of my, the findings of my study. Basically, if you look at the theory of democratization and the theory of civil society, they say it must be locally rooted, otherwise it will fail. So donors have been saying, OK, we understand that. So we need to put local, uh, well, well, basically the countries themselves in the, in the driving seat, otherwise the, the aid will fail. And when I started my research, I thought, OK, these thoughts have been out there for so long. So if I go now to, to two totally different countries, I will find something very different. So I went to Ghana and I went to Indonesia and I was interviewing CSOs um, that were trying to promote democracy in their countries, which, of course, are very different countries. But I found very, very similar types of organization with similar type of mission descriptions, with uh, all working with academics, many of whom had studied in the West. Um, they were having the, the same type of strategies, namely doing research, publishing reports on it, discussing it with parliamentarians. There were no street marchers. There were the organizations were professional organizations without members, so promoting democracy, but n no membership. So nobody was a member of this kind of organization. So who do you represent? And of course, you will not uh, be organizing any uh, protest or march or gathering if you don't have any members. So, so the thing, the only reason that I could explain why they were so similar in those different countries was because of the funding they were receiving. And with this funding came the same type of rules coming from Western donors, basically. You need to have a, a proper accounting system. You need to uh, have this kind of indicators to, to show your success. You need, uh, yeah, especially the, the financial reporting is, is very strong to, to minimize risks. So all these kind of things made that organizations even, well, one director in, of, a, of a CSO in Jakarta told me, 
after the fall of Suharto, we were an activist organization and we participated in the street marches, we organized the communities, and we were very active in, in, uh, in trying to overthrow this regime. And they got picked up by donors because of that. They were very visible. And she was pondering, and she said, like, and now we grew into this legal, um, in this legal center with a lot of expertise, because back then we, we, we had, the, the, we had the, um, the contacts with the community, but we did not know how to translate our demands into, into policies and into laws. And right now we have got that expertise in our organization, we have lawyers, we have all the contacts within parli uh, in Parliament, we have contacts with all the donors, so we're, we are really into this kind of work, but at the same time, we lost the link to those communities. We don't have that anymore. So you gain something, and, but you also you lose something. And the same basically also I saw in, in, uh, with many CSOs in Ghana. So it basically has to do with this kind of monitoring and evaluation rules. So instead of using a logical framework where you have a more fixed approach, so we have, okay, I will do this project with uh, the following outputs. That will lead to the following outcomes and then I will achieve this impact. Um, and of course, then you will focus on, okay, how many outputs will I deliver? What are the outputs? Uh, how will that uh, lead to the outcomes? What type of outcomes? How many? In a theory of change approach, you, you still have the same kind of logic structure. Okay, we, we, are gonna, we are going to do something. We want to change the world. And, um, but it's not so much about defining your exact activities or your exact outputs your exact outcomes, your exact impact, but it's much more about describing the way, explaining it, how you, how you will get there, or how you think you will get there. So I think one of the simple examples I can use to, to, to show the difference is, uh, on the one hand, you're, you're sitting on the beach together with your donor and say, okay, I have a plan, I see an island over there and I want to go there. So you draw a plan and you, uh, the donor looks at it and it says, yeah, that looks like a nice plan. I will give you money and I will, I will, I will stick you to that plan. So you, start, you step into your boat and you sail towards the island, but then you come into a storm. But yeah, you cannot divert course because this is the course you agreed on. So your boat might be wrecked a little. Uh, later on, you, yeah, basically you, you, you jump into a school of very nice fish, uh, which are an endangered species, but you have to to sail over them and maybe destroy a few because you cannot change course. And then in the end, uh, you, uh, you do or you do not end up at the island. In a theory of change approach, it's, it takes a, di a different approach. It says like, okay, you're with your donor on the beach. Okay, let's go to that island. I think that's a good idea. And the, the first few hundred meters, I think we already know kind of how we will do it, but afterwards I will start reporting back to you. So, so we'll be, we will be in contact about the course. So you will avoid the storm, you will avoid the school of fish, and even when you come close to the island, you might see a different island and call back to your donor. I think, hey, we need, to, we, need, we need to divert course to the other island because that's even better. So that is much more a theory of change approach, which is much more flexible, um, but takes a lot more trust. It takes more trust, it takes more time, and it takes more effort from both parties. A very different way of reporting on that. So it's an emphasis on continuous learning and, ad and ad adaptation. Basically what I did when I came to the ministry was write the theory of change for this program. And instead of writing uh, a document which explains the world as it should be, I tried to explain, uh, to, to look at all the assumptions underlying this policy and discussing how complex they are, to show the complexity, that we don't really know how it works in practice always, but we know where we want to go, but we know that in, in the end um, we, might, we might need to change course and some of the assumptions might be wrong, so we might need to change them. So basically what we did was we set up a big research program, of which Nikki was also uh, part in a way, um, to check these assumptions. And not only assumptions about the work we do in developing countries, but also assumptions about the ministry itself because we as a donor are part of the way aid is administered. So what we put in there and the way we put it in affects the way it will be uh, received basically on the ground. 
So that, that includes us as a ministry, that includes northern CSOs, because very often these kind of processes remain outside the scope or the site of, of donors when they evaluate projects. You evaluate your project, what, what, what did you do in Ghana? What did you achieve in Benin? <coughs> so I think it's very important to start looking at yourself as well, because then, then is when you can start learning. So we started to have kind of a mixed methods approach in terms of accountability procedures. So there is some indicators, yes. So how many organizations have you strengthened in terms of lobby and advocacy capacity? Um, how many policies have you been changing? How many um, um, kind of lobby and advocacy initiatives have you been implementing? But these kind of numbers, they never mean much without the more qualitative side, uh, the qualitative data. Because, for instance, if you're fighting for um, an environmental law to be uh, adopted, and you define success as, okay, we have reached success when this law has been adopted, then you can put in money for five years and at the end score a zero because you were not able to uh, adopt this law. But still, if you look at the context, it might be a success because there was a change in government um, and this change in government was basically a government which, would, which wants to open uh, uh, mining operations and they want to, uh, to harvest local forests. And all you have been doing is trying to preserve the status quo. So if you have been able to do that after five years with this amount of money, you can still have had a, a, a very good uh, result of your work. And the use of the money has been very good. Even though your quantitative indicator says, says zero, your qualitative indicator shows that it's still good value, value for money. So it's really about this flexibility and being able to switch plans. One of the organizations, uh, they started working um, they, they had a, a, a nice plan for the Philippines, and this was about mining, uh, because there were many, many mines uh, in natural areas and being planned or, being, or already um, uh, opened. So they want to start lobbying for closing down the mines and strengthening the, the institution that uh, was checking them. But when they started, I think only a few months into the program, and there was a change in government, and the new minister came from the, from the uh, environmental movement, and she did all that, all that stuff. So, so within a few months, they had almost all their targets and, imp and, and impacts, they, they reached it because of a change in the environment. Um, but at the same time, the environment changed also towards a more hostile environment for, um, for activists, where activists were being killed. So they needed to change course to, uh, to adopt a new strategy and to start doing different, different kind of work. Well, this kind of approach to development is, is of course, a very different one than, um, than the ones where you have fixed targets and fixed outputs and outcomes. So, always a strong theory of change or whatever you call it, stories, explanations are needed to interpret these kind of numbers. You cannot only uh, go by these numbers. And within, um, within this program, uh, we kind of developed a way to, to try to do that. But as I told you in the beginning, uh, sometimes it, it's, it, it, it comes to very nice hybrid forms where you invent something new, which is between those schools of thought, but you have, on the one end you have soccer and on the other end you have baseball and you invent something in the middle, which is quite nice. Uh, but sometimes you also have tensions, and we have also seen the tensions in the sense that some people within the ministry, for instance, they said when this, pro when this program came to their country, like, hey, what are you guys doing? I only see a, a vague sketch of something on paper. You cannot start a program here when you have a vague sketch on paper. You should have fixed goals and targets, then you can start. But basically, if you go to the other school of thought and say, no, it, it's, it's, it's basically a quality criteria to have a vague program, because only if I have a vague program, then I have room for local actors to insert uh, the local context into this program, the local needs, the local, um, the local political situation and everything. If I come with a fixed plan, 
I, I, I come probably with a broken plan already from right from the start. So, and the same is also, it's not only in the ministry, it's also in northern CSOs. So I think one of the ways that, um, one of the things I saw is that we got from this research program that the ministry provides a lot of freedom in this, in this program, in the sense of accountability, in the sense of rules and flexibility. And what we saw in the research program is that some of the CSOs, the Dutch CSOs, basically uh, held their partners to a very strict accountability regime. And the reason they did that was that, well, we're only one of their donors. So they have 10, 10 more donors, and they just pick the most strict requirements from the most strict donor and apply them to all to be cost effective. You cannot handle 10 accountability systems within an NGO that will be too, 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 uh, too costly to, to manage. So then you see that <laughs> in a snap second, all your principles and your program goes down the drain because of such, a, such an issue. So with these kind of tensions and things, um, we're still, of course, learning day by day, but I think that's a, a, a main part of this policy. And we're just starting up the, the second phase of this policy, so I'm really looking forward to what that will bring in practice. And of course, as an evaluator, I'm really looking forward to the first, like, first really um, independent evaluation of the, of the dialogue and the SEND program. So I will leave it here, and I think I will give the floor back to Nikki. idea of how donors can begin to do things quite differently in ways that can have strong potential for social and political transformation. Um, I'll pass over to Zoe now, sorry my voice is completely going, um, who's going to talk to us a little bit about what this might mean for the UK. Do we have any potential for similar um, transformation here? Good evening everybody, thanks Nikki and Yalma for that. Um, as Nikki said, she's asked me to come here to speak a little bit about what it's, how it could be interpreted in a UK context. And unfortunately, if you look at the slide that Yelma had with the managerial and the social transformative on each side, I would say that the UK government, the way that the UK spends overseas development aid and funds civil society organisations is firmly on the managerial side. Um, I would say that historically the UK government has been much more progressive than it is now. So we used to have a programme called, or DFID used to have a programme called the Programme Partnership Agreement, they were called the PPAs, and that had much more of a partnership approach and there was a lot more flexibility with it. But those ended in 2016 and what's been replaced um, is much more on the managerial side with three centrally funded mechanisms that come out of di di central DFID called UK Aid Direct, UK Aid Match and UK Aid Connect. And the way that um, DFID approaches these programmes, it's very much in the point that Yelma was talking about with clear log frames, theory of change, um, quite a lot of compliance. The, the grantees, the civil society organisations, NGOs are um, held very much to the kind of results. They have to achieve results. Lots of times they are not given the money in advance, so they have to pay, they have to achieve the results and then they get paid for them. And this, what this does is, as Yelma says, is it creates um, much more of a service delivery type of program and you are seeing beneficiaries as customers and you are delivering a product. And I'd say this is very much added to by the way that the UK government does a, spends a lot of its overseas development aid is through commercial contracts. And this is, these um, NGOs, civil society organisations can apply for commercial contracts, but also private sector organisations can apply for these contracts. And I mean, it's the same in lots of other um, departments throughout the UK government, so the health department, the education department as well. Um, but private sector consultancies such as um, PricewaterhouseCoopers and other ones will be competing with UK and national level NGOs in order to deliver these contracts. And the way that these operate is they tend to work through something called payment by results, or PBR, which is very much 
in an uh, easy way of explaining it, you only get paid once you deliver the results. And it's, again, creating a, a customer type of approach. And DFID recently created a framework um, called the International Multidisciplinary Framework. It's IMDP. And this is a £3 billion framework of commercial contracts, which shows the amount of money that's going to go out through this managerial approach that Yelma was talking about. Um, so I may sound quite negative, but I don't mean to. This is just kind of the environment that, that DFID and the UK government are operating in at the moment. Um, and one, one, if you are looking for more information about how the UK government funds civil society organisations, I would recommend looking at an ICAI review. This is the Independent Commission of Aid Impact. They did a review in April last year that looked at DFID's relationship or partnership, they call it, with civil society organisations. And unfortunately, or fortunately, DFID got what's called an amber-red rating, which is a very poor rating. And if you look through it, it's all about how DFID funds civil society organisations. It's very much a lot of the work that I do trying to influence DFID and with how they fund and how much they listen to me is, is up for debate. But um, within that, you see see that DFID, with their amber-red rating, was slammed for lots of the things on the more managerial side, and whether, if there, is there any evidence to actually support that the way that they operate with this very structured approach actually has the impact that they want to achieve, and given the amber-red rating, you'll see that the answer is no, and since then, with ICAI reviews, what happens is DFID has to come back with um, they respond, there are recommendations in there, and DFID has to respond to them, and as a result of them, they have to come up with an action plan of what they're going to do to try and um, change, to improve, so to speak. Um, and we're, we've had those recommendations, and afterwards, a year later, there's a follow-up, so that's due soon. So it'll be interesting to see how DFID has changed since they got quite a poor rating. Um, so that will be due out around April time. That's a key bit of information if you want to do a bit of background research. Um, what I've, what the, one of the other things that Nikki asked me to talk through was um, what is the likelihood of the UK government changing their approach so it's more towards the social, social transformative side. Um, I would say in the current environment, it's, that's quite poor. Um, with some of the conversations I've had previously, um, I really think, I think when you have to think about um, institutional donors and government donors is that they're, they're political machines. They're very much based on the, the government of the day. And I would suggest that if we'd had a different election results at the end of last year, the way DFID operate, the way DFID fund would be very different to how it is now if a different government was in power. Um, and in particular, the way that DFID operates at the moment, it's very much um, it's very much focused on kind of procurement. It's very much focused on being on risk and not wanting to take too much risk. It's also the way it operates is that they have something called the Daily Mail test in that they don't, and this is within NGOs as well, is that there's kind of a worry that they don't want to do something in case it creates a negative uh, newspaper article within the Daily Mail. So all of this, combined with a lack of trust for NGOs, for things such as the safeguarding scandal that, we, that was hit a couple of years ago, means that DFID and UK government are very much more on this managerial path. There isn't the flexibility to allow for NGOs to move towards social, the social transformative partnership side, which is unfortunate. Um, but... If, for example, we did, have, we did wake up in December and there was a different result and the UK government was, was with a different party or with a different couple of parties, depending what had happened, um, I, think the, the, there are, I think that the UK NGOs and local partners that the UK NGOs work with in, in the global south, I think they would definitely be very open to working on the more social transformative side. It would mean 
that they'd have to change the way that they operate. So as Yelma said, the way um, the setup for um, NGOs, civil society organisations, is very much to manage contracts. It's very much to set up to move money from one organisation to another organisation with this kind of large operational system. But I think if UK NGOs and other NGOs in, in the north were actually to sit back and look at why they, uh, why they operate, I think, there is a, I think they would be keen to do the more social transformative side, um, approach. Um, I think that um, I think it, I think it will be interesting over the next couple of years to see whether this does happen. Um, but it's it's it 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 would be it would be it would be a slow process. Thank you.